Hi, and welcome to this live reading from In Plain Sight, a Logan McKenna mystery book number eight by Valerie Davison. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue. December 2021, two days before Christmas, Old Town, Portland, Oregon. Fifteen more minutes, but that was as long as he was waiting for this asshole. The man stamped his feet on the brick pavers and shoved his hands in his armpits. Night had fallen hours ago, but with ambient light from the traffic signal and a few neon bar signs, he could still see well enough. There wasn't much to look at. Behind him rose the empty hulk of the old Greyhound bus depot. He didn't know it, but in its time it was hailed as a shining example of modern architecture, a real jewel in the city's crown. Now, stripped of its former glory, all that remained were streaked slabs of dismal gray concrete stretched across a series of darkened doorways. It was so cold, not even the crazies were out. Not even his favorite, the old lady who ran around half-naked, babbling to herself, shitting in doorways, stepping on stray needles the attics had thrown away, and not feeling a thing. Even she must have found a shelter or a tarp to curl up under on this cold night. Come on, where are you? Five more minutes. Then that was it. He'd leave and consider this deal dead. Squinting past the line of tents and tarps strung along the sidewalk like grimy pearls, he considered walking around the block to keep his feet from freezing, but he didn't want to miss his customer. Besides, he re didn't really need to stay on the move. He could stand right here with a sign that said, get your drugs here and not have to worry about the police. The cops never came down here unless they were called, and even then it would be a long wait. People who lived here learned to handle things themselves. Frustrated, he stamped his feet again and blew on his fingers to keep warm. His breath came out in white puffs, swirled, then floated away in the frigid air. He remembered something from sixth grade science about condensation happening when the warm air from his mouth hit the cold air outside. He shoved his hands into his pockets and felt around. Good. The package was still there. This better be the right stuff. His client had been very specific. The roofies were easy, he could get those any day of the week, but the other product was harder to find. Since this drug wasn't used to get high, it wasn't as readily available. Dealers tended to keep a larger supply of their customers' most desired substances on hand. Heroin, meth, coke, oxy, and E, whatever made them feel good or at least made the world, real world fade away for a little while. Yes, the order had been hard to fill, but he took pride in being able to procure anything his customers desired. He had connections, and this customer was a regular, paid in cash. Never a problem. Finally, there was movement at the end of the street. He watched as his customer, dressed in dark pants, boots, and a hoodie, deftly stepped around a blue tent at the end of the row and continued at a deliberate pace toward him. By all means, take your sweet time. I've only been out here freezing my ass off for the last hour waiting for you. He knew better than to voice his complaints out loud. This was business, and even though business was good, he couldn't afford to lose any. Let's just get this done. Without bothering with the niceties or an apology for being late, product and cash were exchanged efficiently. No need to ask after each other's families or how the trailblazers were doing this year. They were there for one reason and one reason only. Even though cops rarely patrolled this area, there was no sense hanging around. He had survived this long by not taking unnecessary risks. He watched until his customer turned the corner. He wondered again about the unusual request. Out of curiosity, he had researched the product when he got the order. It was very specific. It had to be the injectable form. It was used in a variety of ways, some to relieve suffering, some to cause it to hurt or to heal. He wondered which of those end results was cu his customer had in mind. Gave him the creeps. Maybe he should stop doing business with this one after all. Shoving the cash deeper into his pocket, the dealer pulled his wool beanie down tighter over his ears and crossed the street, heading for his own neighborhood. He had money in his pocket and the night was young. He'd long ago learned not to indulge in his own product. Tequila was his drug of choice and he had the rest of the night to enjoy it. Chapter One, Three Weeks Earlier. Woohoo! Logan looked out the kitchen window and saw Sam dancing up the driveway, holding aloft two wiggly clawed Dungeness crabs, one in each hand, all while valiantly trying to keep her hot pink rhinestone encrusted cat eyeglasses from sliding off her nose. 
The crabs were very much alive, but the tiny woman kept a firm hold, gripping them expertly from the bottom so their sharp claws couldn't reach her fingers or any other part of her anatomy. Sam was Samantha B. Pullman, reporter for the local weekly paper, The News Times. She and her husband, Tim, owned a small crab boat, which had just returned from its first trip of the season. For the first time in forever, the boats were going out on time and for one of the best prices for crab they'd ever negotiated. After offloading their catch, Tim and his crew went right back out, but he'd sent some celebratory crustaceans over with Sam for what he dubbed the Coram Camerant Coffee Crew to enjoy. The CCC consisted of Sam, Logan, and Jane, Tim's sister. Tim was an honorary member. Before moving to Oregon, Logan had never heard of cormorants, but learned the ubiquitous long-necked seabirds found all along the Oregon coast were so successful at diving and catching their dinner that they were considered good luck charms by the fishermen. Last Christmas, Sam gave each of them a mug with a cormorant on one side and their name on the other. They used them every time they got together. Tim's sister, Jean Pullman, was not only the Lincoln County Medical Examiner, but had a full-time practice in Lincoln City, just north of Depot Bay. The three women became friends a year ago while working to keep a young man out of jail for a murder he didn't commit. Sam and Logan met for breakfast burritos at Pirate's Coffee every Wednesday, and Jean joined them whether her patients, dead or alive, didn't require her immediate attention. Sam danced back to the truck and returned the two crabs to the cooler to party with their friends until bath time. She deftly kicked the tailgate shut before struggling up the walk with the cooler, her glasses securely back in place for now. Wow, those are huge, Logan called out the window for, before drying her hands and going to help her in the front door. How many are in there? She almost felt guilty that her own contribution to the meal consisted of a bowl of coleslaw, but even that had stretched her limited culinary skills. Except for the roast chicken her French foreign exchange mother had insisted she learn to make, Logan was more of an assembler than a cook. Jean was bringing the bread, fresh sourdough from Depot Bakery over in Salisham. Only the best, of course. Jean did pretty much everything in perfection. Sam hauled the cooler onto the counter next to the sink and went back to get, get the crab pot from the truck. Logan didn't own a pot big enough. When she saw her carrying it back, Logan was grateful her gas range was built into the, into the island and not in the counter under the cupboards. Otherwise, it would never have fit. I never got you a housewarming present, Sam said over her shoulder as she filled the pot with water in the sink. Besides, no self-respecting friend of a fisherman doesn't have a crab pot. Now you no longer have to live in shame. She grinned, tucking a curve of shiny jet black hair behind her ear. Thank you, Logan said, wondering where she was going to store it when they were done. Probably out in the garage. Still, it was nice to be welcomed into the fold. Her husband, Ben, would know what to do with it. He was the cook in the family. Sam lit the burner under the pot. They had plenty of time to visit before that amount of water came to a boil. Now, point me to that beer. Logan handed her a, rug, a rogue brewery knuckle buster IPA from the fridge on the way and grabbed one for herself. Jean always stuck to wine. Did I get the right one? Logan asked as Sam looked at the label. In answer, Sam smiled, popped the tab, took a long drink, sitting down in one of the two big chairs in the living room, bookending the fireplace. Ah, she said, toasting Logan with a half-empty can. So how's Tim? Is he satisfied with the first run, load, catch, trip out? Logan said, settling into the other chair. She wasn't sure what the correct fishing lingo was. Oh, yeah, it was a great haul, Sam said. The whole crew is exhausted, but it's all worth it. Everyone's bank accounts are going to look a lot healthier in a few weeks, including ours. And, she added, answering Logan's first question, even better, no accidents reported so far. Weather's holding. Let's hope it stays that way. Logan didn't know much about commercial fishing, but she had tried to educate herself about what her neighbors did for a living since she and Ben had bought the house in Depot Bay and were spending more and more time up here on the Oregon coast. Crabbing season officially opened December 1 each year, but for several years, the start of the season had been delayed either to demoic acid levels being too high, Logan had no idea what demoic acid was, but she assumed high levels were bad for you, or there were not enough meat on the crabs. The fishermen had been taking a big financial hit, not just from the delay of the season, but from low prices. This year, for the first time in a long time, all the stars aligned. The weather was good. The crabs meaty, levels of demoic acid low, and the opening day price was the highest ever negotiated with the processing plant. Everyone was ecstatic when the season opened yesterday, December 1, right on schedule. 
Well, then tonight we celebrate, Logan said, raising her beer in a toast. Later, when Jean arrived and Logan got up to let her in, she realized how late it had gotten. Sometime while she and Sam were catching up, the sun had gone down and a gusty rain shower was gaining momentum. Without meaning to, Jean always made an entrance. A few inches taller than Logan, she appeared even more statuesque due to her elegant updo, accentuated by what she called her skunk stripe, a natural white streak that swept boldly through her thick black hair. From the top of her French twist to the tips of her manicured nails, the woman was always impeccable. Carrying a stylish leather bag with two bottles of wine poking out the top and ex ex exuding the tantalizing aroma of fresh sourdough bread, Jean wiped her feet on the mat and gave Logan a hug. Shrugging off her cashmere coat, she strode into the kitchen. Trailing behind, Logan took note of today's shoes, low-heeled leather boots in, in an electric blue, very expensive looking. She'd rarely seen a repeat of she'd rarely seen her repeat of footwear selection. Her shoes were the only bright spot Jean allowed in her otherwise black and white wardrobe. Somehow her boots had made it from the car to the house in pristine condition. Nary a mud splatter or drop of water on them. How did she do that? Sorry I'm late, Jean said. Had a last minute emergency. <laughs>